You people are scary. Thanks for joining me here on Living Right with Dr. Ray. I'm Dr. Ray Garendi, and for the next hour, hopefully, we can help you live right. We got the show jammed today. Father Larry Richards is coming in with Catechism Wisdom. Also, an EWTN Global Catholic Radio favorite, Al Cresta, is going to be with us. I'm a little offended here. As soon as you folks found out Al was coming in, we had bigger crowds. When I was doing this by myself, I had three people in the audience, my wife and two of my children. Also, we're going to take your questions. We've got role play. We've got at home. And I am absolutely delighted to look. This looks like one of our higher IQ audiences. It, it really does. It really does. Oh, you know, you know what I've been hearing from more and more women? I am hearing more moms and wives tell me that they are the lead authorities in their homes. They, well, you're nodding your head. It's like, oh, okay, I came to the right program. <laughs> They're the ones who set the rules, set the discipline, set the structure, set the expectation, and Disney dad over here, Mr. Good Time, Mr. Laid Back Oblivious, Mr. Honey, I was that way when I was a kid. I think I turned out pretty good. And the women are thinking, let's gather the relatives and vote. <laughs> More and more ladies are telling me they are doing the lioness's share of the discipline in the homes. Gentlemen, a suggestion. Protect. Now that's a sound bite. We guys can digest that. Protect. I doubt that you would ever let anybody else talk to your wife like that child may talk to your wife on a day-to-day -day basis. The next time, you hear, you got that look on your face. It's just like, what's he saying? <laughs> Stick with me, I'm going to get to it. The next time you hear your wife locked into a battle with a child, don't sit in the Barca lounger, in the other room, thinking to yourself, I close my eyes, I can't tell which one of them's a 12 year old. <laughs> get in there and protect. That's not just your mom you're talking to that way. That's my wife. I'm going to find out what she wants me to do about this. Well, you can't protect. You got to give permission to protect first, okay? You could get hurt. I'm, if you keep laughing like that, this whole show is going to drag out. I'm going to find out what she wants me to do about this, and then I'm going to do more. I'll tell you what, gentlemen, you do that a few times for the ladies, they feel very loved. They feel very kindly toward you. Sometimes I'll give my boys a couple bucks. I'll say, go down and give your mother grief. I'll be right down. <laughs> well, we, in our at-home segment, we have a little vignette that touches upon mom and dad structural family differences. Let's take a look at our Living Right cameras. Well, I think it was not unbeknownst. They knew we were there. And they lived happily ever after. The end. What are you guys doing? We're reading bedtime stories. But it's way past his bedtime. Yeah, but we can't skip his story. Give me a second. What? If he gets off his schedule, he is just a nightmare the next day. Yeah, but we've got to do a story. If he's going to learn to read, we have to read every night. I understand that. I know that's important. But it's more important that he stick to his schedule. Yeah, but just missing his bedtime by a few minutes is no big deal. It adds up. By the end of the week, he is just miserable. Yeah, but we expect him to learn to read. We have to have repetition. We have to do it every day. Then do it sooner. All right. Well, then we have to give him his bath sooner. Well, that... It must have been one boring story. That's all I can say. All right. I need someone to comment on this. What do you do? Hold in that a hold that up right here, like young lady. Go. What do you do in a situation like that? Look, as I tell my boys, do 
what your mother tells you <laughs> and you won't get hurt. I have been one to say that the person who carries the heaviest share of the parenting load on a day-to-day -day basis kind of has upper hand. You know, if mom has to deal with that little guy the next day, all day long, and dad is wherever he is, then I think he's wise to yield to mom. I know I do this all the time too. I'll come home, I'll wanna, you know, my younger kids. My younger kids, my, my youngest daughter right now is 12, and I don't wanna get slack in my parenting, but, but I think I have. The other night it was maybe half hour past her bedtime, it was like 3 a.m. <laughs> and I said, honey, let's spend some quality time together, me and Liz. And she says, Ray, you don't have to deal with the kids. And, I, and she's right. She's right. So in this case right here with Dad, I think he would have been wise to say, all right, we'll read some other time. We can, we can read when he's awake. <laughs> Q&A. Audience Q&A. Now, I just want to say that I, <clears throat> I have no knowledge of what these questions are. This is perfectly random. Uh, <laughs> Who has a question for us? I'll take that mic over to him there, young. That's what I do. It's, it's part of the union contract. <laughs> Sir, your name? Uh, Steve. Hi, Steve. Uh, Doctor, I have uh, two boys, one that's four and one that's one and a half. And during dinner time, our four-year-old uh, often doesn't want to eat. And uh, my wife and I think it's very important that he eats. Have, yeah, well, that is that's well, we that's like, real like important. The, you're, I can tell you're an experienced parent. <laughs> Breathing, eating, those, those are big things. We, we feel that uh, having a family dinner is very important, that we all sit down and eat at the same time. Sometimes it ends up just being a struggle because he gets distracted, he wants to play, and he doesn't want to sit and eat with the family. I hate, is this your wife sitting next to you? I, I hate to say this to you. You got, you got the four-year-old who doesn't want to eat. Your husband's pretty slender. <laughs> Have you thought about your cooking? <laughs> just, just, I, I don't bring, just, just a thought, okay? 150 years ago, your little four-year-old would have been sitting at that farm table, and mom would have given him some kind of stone ground wheat bread with corn, and he's probably not going to go, Ugh. how many nights in a row have we had stone ground wheat bread with corn? No, he's going to eat it. One of the byproducts that we are so well fed in this country is that we get pickier. And little kids just get pickier and pickier and pickier and pickier. Oh, Mom, I, I don't want that one. <laughs> Why not? Because I just don't like the way it tastes. You ate it yesterday. I know, but, but it was a different color yesterday. I don't like the color. <laughs> That's what's happening. I would suggest, don't be a short order cook, Mom. All right, here is our food. Here are the things you're going to try. Don't sit there forever. They can be there until 6 o'clock at night from breakfast. <laughs> Don't do that. Put a time limit on it. If he wants to eat later, the stuff is still in the refrigerator or there's no snackies. Sometimes what happens, parents panic. You know, the kid is going to waste away. So what we do is we have, you see these carrots? They taste just like Twinkies. They do. They taste just like Twinkies. These carrots have cream filling in them. They really do. You can have some of those. Don't let it be a stressor. Simply have the food there. That's the food. He can try certain things. Yeah, he doesn't have to eat liver and onions. But certain things end the meal. Enough of that. Okay? All right, we got other questions here. Yes, ma'am, I'll get you the mic. Your name, please. My name is Barb. Hi, Barb. And having adult grown children with families, I'd like to know the best approach to take with the one group that we never hear from. When you say never, what's never? Well, if we call and talk or invite, then we communicate, but their lives seem so hectic and so busy that even when you call, you're getting them on the run or on the fly, and there's yeah, they won't minimal, talk to me either. I, minimal I've conversation. To them a of times. <laughs> um, do you keep pushing it? Do you wait till you hear from them? Which I wanted to send an email yesterday that said we are still alive. Oh, don't, 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 don't. <laughs> I know you might want to say that. Oh, you know, they come over and you say, oh, and your name is? <laughs> Couple of things. First of all, you got to be careful about taking it personally. If they've gotten themselves pulled into the go-go American lifestyle, then sadly, 
family connections sometimes get shunted to the side. That's sad, but it's a reality. Try not to take it personal if it's not personal. Now, if there's hostility going on, some kind of bad family dynamic, yeah, then, then you could take it personal because you've got other things to work through. But if it's just, Mom, we're so busy, like Cats in the Cradle song, you know, from uh, Harry Chapin, you know, we'll get together then, Mom, you'll know yeah, we'll have a good exactly. time then. Try not to take it personal. You're going to be the big person here. You're going to be the one who periodically makes the contacts, who still invites to Christmas Eve, who sends the birthday cards, who sends the little Bible on, on confirmation day. You're going to be the one who does that. You're going to be the grown-up. And hopefully, hopefully your kids will come around to realize mom's pretty valuable and mom matters. I remember I went through a period like that that I, I'm ashamed of it. I went through it where mom and dad just yeah, mom and dad are there, they're on the shelf, and that's fine, and I'm, I'm busy. I've got places to go, people to see. So, I learned as I got older, mom and dad are, are really the ones that were always there, the ones I could count on, the ones that supported me. Both of my parents are now passed away, but if, if they were alive, if my mother were alive, no doubt in my mind, there'd be 800 people sitting in this audience. <laughs> My mom, do you want to go see my son on television? <laughs> I'll tell you what, we got, I got to get to the mailbag. So what I want to do, I want to do a role play. In the role play, we do a before and an after. I need somebody to help me out. It's like, it's like government class when you were in high school. You look for the person who's looking down and you call on them. Your name, young lady? Anita. Anita. Come on up, Anita. Hey, Anita. All right. You're going to do all your own stunts, all right? <laughs> okay. No teleprompters, no doubt. Here's the scenario. You are my wife. This is the fifth year in a row we are going to go to Florida with my parents and two of my brothers and sisters and their families, and the kids are really obnoxious. You finally have had enough. You've been gritting your teeth through the last three years trying to be sweet about this whole thing. You don't want to go. We're leaving in a month and a half. You're breaking the news to me. Go ahead. Ray? Hmm. I, when that finger goes up, I get nervous. <laughs> you know, I have had it. Had what? Up to here. What up to here? We are going to Boca again for the fifth time. Oh, oh, you're not happy about going to Boca? My parents pick up the fee. Boca. Most people would say, this is great what your parents are doing. You're I, knew, I knew this was coming. I knew this was coming. I smelled it last year. Why don't you want to go? She gets on my last nerve. I just don't get on with her. Uh, she, she I'm sorry. I, I mean, she's she a nice... She tries. She, try she gets along with you. She's always... You know what, Ray? I feel like Deborah and she's Marie. You know, Raymond, the show? <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, she tells me how to raise the kids. She's telling me. She doesn't uh, tell you how to raise the kids. She's only said one thing every once in a while. You can't just. Every once in a while? Every once in a while? If she doesn't say anything, why do you think she's thinking something bad? Because she always will sort of have that Marie sneer. And she'll say, you know, honey, let me just do this for you. Or I used to do it like this. Or I Ray think, liked I, it I like that. And I've I, always been insecure with my mother. You've always I, been insecure oh, with my mother. Oh, my. That's very good. That scares me. That scares me. You should be scared. All right, now you know what? what's okay, happening Ray, Ray. here. I want to make peace. I want to make peace. I, I you see what's happening I here. Wanna make, I want to make. I can't uh, stop her. She's got the teleprompter. She's on a roll. I want, I want We're to be, arguing, and I challenged everything she said. I didn't even listen to her. Everything she said, what did I say? I said, you're wrong. Let's do this a little better. It's what I call in marriage accept it. Let's try this again, okay? Anita's going to tell me she's not gone. Go ahead, Anita. Ray, hmm? I'm not going with you guys this year. I've had it. Sorry. What have you had, honey? What, what's going on there? I just want the two of us to make our own memories. I want to go on a vacation, just the two of us. I mean, Boca for five years, I know the two of us like to go hiking, okay? We both like to go um, snorkeling. Is it my mom? 
I mean, I know she could be tough. I know she could be real tough. And I'll tell you, uh, I got to admire the way you handle her. You really do. She, she'd send most people over the edge. You know, I know that. And, and, and you, finally, you finally hit your limit. I mean, is it over? No chance? No way? No how? No. Just this time, I'd like just the two of us to go together so we can make our memories. Uh, so we can set something for the kids to, you know, think about and to emulate. I want it to be like, like I when we were dating. That. I can see that, honey. I is can that, see is that. Is that so no, bad? No, no, it's not so bad at all. We just got to figure out how to gently get out of this because they've okay. been so used to us going. I know. And I don't want them to take it personal. I don't want to create a family. See what's happening? She told me, she basically told me, and I accepted it. I don't agree with her. I'm still trying to figure out how to get her to go. But I didn't immediately start challenging her. Right away quick in saying, you don't know what you're talking about. You're clueless. You need to get a life and get along with my mother. I didn't do that. Okay? Thanks, Anita. Thank you so Thank much. You're you. wonderful. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I just want to say one thing. If I was married to her, I'd be scared. You see, <laughs> you see this kind of this kind of stuff and then this kind of stuff? I almost felt like she was gonna go, and your little dog too. <laughs> Let's see what we got here for the person bag. Dear Dr. Ray, this is from Barbara in Ohio. For disrespect, I assigned my 16-year-old son an essay to write, and his disrespect continued until he worked his way from 500 to 900 words. Here's his essay. Respect is only given if earned. Those who want to be held in high regard have to earn it first. If one does not earn respect, they should not expect respect in return. In order to be considered worthy of high regard or praise, one must treat others with respect and to be courteous to them. When someone treats you without any courtesy, you lose respect for them. When someone slams down hefty punishments, wonder who that would be, for a small misdemeanor, respect is thrown out the window. He just went from slander to libel. <laughs> Essays submitted have to be respectful. You can't get an essay from a kid on respect, telling you how you're totally wrong. You mishandled this completely. That's what he did. That essay doesn't count. I had a mom one time look at an essay like that. Such a classic, and I'm afraid, Anita, you could do this. <laughs> she looked, she read it, and she went, from a 500-word essay, to 500 pieces of paper. She basically said, you need to do this over. This is not an essay on your own responsibility. Don't let them go from slander to libel. You don't go anywhere either because, I'll make you write an essay too, <laughs> group essay. Al Cresta, dear friend of mine and a very popular radio host on EWT and Global Catholic Radio is coming in for the guest segment, I learn a ton from Al. The guy's an encyclopedia. The guy's basically an encyclopedia. I want to say, Al, do you ever not read everything in the whole world? I would want to see him on Jeopardy. I'll bet Al could go all the way to the $500 category on Jeopardy. I went to the $100 category on hair care. That's about <laughs> as far as I went. Al's the only guy I know that can do rivers in Siberia and get them. So don't go away. Al Cresta coming up here on Living Right with Dr. Ray. Thank you. If they aren't going to discipline me now, there's when I get older, no one's going to discipline me. How much time is wasted of our lives just watching TV or just going on the internet? And God's created us to make a difference in the world. Folks, just got to get out more. <laughs> Welcome back to Living Right with Dr. Ray. My guest, Al Cresta, a dear friend and a very popular EWTN Global Catholic radio host, Cresta in the afternoon. And I know between you and I, Al, I know you do it in the afternoon because you just can't get up in the morning. It's pretty much <laughs> that's true. for you, it's all about commitment. Yeah, that's right. You have to tell the folks how we first met. Oh. 
we we met uh, in is it 1980 81 it was no no, no i was in middle school i, I, I couldn't <laughs> that couldn't have been it i was hosting i was hosting a program called talk from the heart in detroit for crawford and that broadcasting was not a catholic program no right? that was a evangel largely evangelical protestant program and it was uh you know it, was, it dealt with theology dealt with apologetics it dealt with culture issues and and i had uh, seen a book uh, that you had done. Um, I wrote it as a freshman. <laughs> well, I saw you had got a government grant on it. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, saw, I thumbed through it and I, I noticed that, you know, you're a psychologist and you had a, a special interest in questions dealing with spirituality and religion. I thought, well, that's interesting because I didn't know anything about your background, you know. So you have to, I think you must have been coming through town or something. Mm -hmm. So we, we called up Detroit, your publicist. Right? Yeah, and you came into Detroit. We had a wonderful interview. And uh, what I loved about it, again, was that uh, you were taking seriously the role that faith plays in holding families together. And that was something that wasn't being said very much back in the early 1980s. What was the date on that? I liked 19, the book was uh, 1990. 1990, yeah. okay. So That's I, was, was. I was a senior in high school. Yeah. What was it? What was interesting is I remember when you interviewed me, and you've interviewed me, what dozens oh, yeah. of times? Yeah, by now, yeah. So this is the first time I get to interview you, really. Yeah, and I've been holding back all these years. So my I, first question I didn't real, is: I didn't realize you were in such debt. Well, yeah. I, I, this is my first question. Um, given the burgeoning democratic crisis in uh, Eastern Europe, I'm thinking that those countries still tied to the rather antediluvian gold standard that they uh, pursued for so many centuries have gonna, gonna basically bring about a monetizing of the money supply. So given that, Al, comment on how that and uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt's San Juan March are related. <laughs> Actually- It all goes back to Nixon. All right. <laughs> okay, now here is the question. I, as an American, I, I don't like being told what to do. I don't like being ruled, mm -hmm. all right? Um, this idea of our country founded away from kingship, mm -hmm. away from the guy in England that's gonna order us around. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we are religious people. Uh, I, I don't want this king idea. So Christ the king mm -hmm. may kind of sit a little uneasy with me. Yeah. You've done yeah. a lot of thinking about that. I have. In fact, uh, the, the doctrine of Christ the King is one of those doctrines which is there on the books, but it's rarely books. <laughs> it's rarely <laughs> talked about in Catholic You're circles. You're right. You know, uh, I I worship at a parish called Christ the King in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and you know, over the years, I've I've been thinking, well, that what's this, what's this name mean? And well, people think that when they think of Christ the King they tend to almost always remove it from political considerations, believe it or not. I mean, this is the way they deal with it. Christ is the king. Well, yeah, at the end of history, oh, he's so going to be not, the king. He's not necessarily ruling fully right, right now. Or Christ is the king, he rules in my heart. You know, so that's, keep it interior. Or Christ uh, is the king over spiritual things, not secular things. Not or, my checkbook. Right, or your or your uh, or your date book, um, in your case. Yeah. yeah, I don't really have much of a checkbook. But. Yeah, I didn't think you were keeping much of a date book anymore. <laughs> no, either. no, all my my little black book all has MD after <laughs> all the names. Are. Gotcha. But uh, really, we privatize Christ's kingship. You know, we keep it inside. It's just personal. Or we postpone Christ's kingship. We push it to the end of history when he's going to come again. Or uh, we somehow compartmentalize it. We say, well, he's king, yeah, but only over this area. Or we say he's not king over unbelievers. I set the terms. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's I a don't way want to of, think that. That's true. Americans don't do kings, you know. They don't do kings. They don't do queens. They, don't, they think that uh, uh, if it's to be authentically political, then it has to conform to the kind of world that we're accustomed to living in which is a constitutional republic. So I make Christ fit, I make Christ fit my view of things as opposed to me fitting his yeah. kingship view of things. Yeah. What does king mean? I mean okay, so yes. I, I can say, I consider safely ensconced here in the studio, I can say, Christ is my Lord and King. That's right. Okay. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, it means, it means that he has a claim uh, on your life 
but it means that he has a claim on the world as well because one he created the world so in the sense that he he has just by virtue of uh, owning the real estate uh, he's the king but more importantly we learn what kind of king he is uh, when we see him take on human flesh and uh, there are two wonderful instances in the New Testament where we can get an idea of what Christ's kingship actually means and that's uh, on Palm Sunday and also in his dialogue with uh, Pontius Pilate. Uh, so on the Palm Sunday, uh, Jesus uh, enters uh, Jerusalem through the Mount of Olives. It's the area that kingship, the king was supposed to come, the Messiah was supposed to come. He knew uh, what he was doing. He knew what he was doing, and this is important. Uh, he also told the disciples, you know, go and tell uh, whoever you find there that uh, the, uh, uh, the Lord needs this uh, donkey. And uh, this was a common practice on the part of kings. They would requisition modes of transporta transportation like that, and people were supposed to just yield uh, what they had. Now, in this particular case, I think it's important to point out that when the apostles said, uh, you know, the Lord has needed your donkey here, uh, they also said he'll return it. Oh, was that yes. right? What's the significance of that? Well, uh, kings, if you remember in Second uh, Samuel, the, the, when Samuel warned Israel about the kind of king that they would get. They wanted a king so they could be like the other nations. Your king will come gentle, riding and, on Yes, the well, that's in Zechariah. But in this one, in Samuel, we're told that the king would uh, conscript people in the military service. He would tax them. He would rule over them. He would lord it over them. A political kind of king. Yes. Whereas with Jesus, the, the, he's going to return the donkey to this guy. He's not going to conscripted in high uh, tax, for see. instance. I'm not going to and, do what you think I'm going to do. Exactly. And then in you mentioned the passage from Zechariah, uh, chapter 9, verse 9, which Matthew actually quotes in this Palm Sunday uh, story. Because Jesus rides the donkey, who has never been sat on before. The donkey is considered, interestingly enough, the donkey is a highly symbolic figure in ancient Israel. Uh, you know, that... We understand uh, our pop culture references here in America. We don't understand the pop culture references in ancient Israel very well. But a donkey, when they would sing about a donkey or do poetry about a donkey or talk about donkeys, one of the symbolic meanings for a donkey was that it was uh, uh, an animal of humility, it was an animal of peace, and yet it was an animal that was used by David, the royal king, uh, during his era, because that was before there were war horses. Uh, so the donkey had peace, humility, and Davidic royalty attached to it. Jesus comes on this donkey. Whoa, Matthew that. quotes Zechariah 9, says, Israel, or daughter of Zion, your king comes to you uh, on the colt or the young of a donkey. Wait a minute. Well, doesn't... Okay. Is Christ sending a mixed message here? On one hand, I am Lord of all. Yeah. On another hand, I'm not going to do the things that you think the Lord of all right. would do. Yeah. So wouldn't that kind of make us lean toward putting Christ in our box? End of the world king, in my heart king, mm. king of the things I want to let him to be king over. Yeah. How do I surrender that? How do I open up and say, I've always got to look at He rules my life and the world? It has to do with the nature of power. And that leads to the next instance where we see Christ discuss kingship, and it's with Pilate. Uh, so he's brought before Pilate. And uh, Pilate says, you know, what, what, they say that you're a king. And uh, Jesus says, well, so do you believe that? Uh, he, and Pilate says, no, what do I have to do with your law? I, I, I don't have anything to do with this. And he says, but uh, are you saying you're king? Jesus says, yeah, I am. I'm, he says, you're king of the Jews? Jesus says, yes, I'm king. And uh, Pilate wants to know, now he's got something to sink his Jesus teeth into. Jesus had to tell the truth. He told the truth. He had to tell he the truth. He is king. And uh, Pilate wants to know, though, what is the basis of your dominion? What's the basis of your sovereignty? Because Pilate knows that the basis of Roman sovereignty is power. It, it's it's uh, not reason, it's not love, it's not even order, but it's primarily the exercise of power. Uh, this is during the era of Augustus, 
uh, the nephew of Julius Caesar. Augustus was referred to as the Son of God. Uh, the, though, the, one of the ways the Roman Empire was held together, they were very tolerant about religion. It's just that you had to pinch incense uh, to the emperor. That cult begins with Julius Caesar and gets formalized under Augustus Caesar. But it's, it's a cult of power. Uh, so he was searching where you get in your power. Where, and and uh, Jesus says, look, uh, my kingdom's not of this world. By which he's saying uh, in the Greek, it means it's not, it doesn't originate in this world. Would that be it why comes Jesus from somewhere said, else. I could call many legions of exactly. angels? He's making his point. It's like, hey, I got power. I, it, power's not it, though. That isn't the okay. way he's going to rule. Uh, he says, and this is a beautiful passage here. I just caught this uh, recently. Uh, reading it. I've been reading this for years. I just caught this the other day. He said, uh, my kingship is not of this world. And uh, Pilate clarifies, but you are a king. He says, yes, for this I was born. For this reason I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. What is truth? Right. So Pilate then says, truth? What's truth have to do with anything? This is Dominion, sovereignty is about politics. Power. It's about power. Uh, Jesus says, no, that's not, I'm not engaging in that. I'm, I come to bear witness to the truth. And so Pilate then is stuck. He's got somebody who's claiming there's a whole different basis upon which one orders society, upon which one orders a kingdom. And that's what Christians can keep in mind when they get involved with political activity. We bring something very different to bear uh, on the political process. We have a different understanding of the human person. We have the truth as it's been mediated to us uh, through the teaching of the church, through divine revelation. Uh, we have a different understanding of the human person, his origin, his destiny. We have a different understanding of what the nature of the kingdom is, the kind of world that God wants. So, and it's not built on sheer exercise of power. In your evangelical world, there was a phrase back then, he is either Lord of all, yeah. or he's not Lord at all. At all. Yeah. Well, my IQ went up about six, eight points. <laughs> my dear friend, guest, Al Cresta, stay tuned. We got more coming. <laughs> Well, we psychologists deal in reality. I'm a clinical psychologist. Sometimes people will say, are you a real doctor? Oh, not a real doctor, but we do have a real child psychologist here today, Dr. John. Why can't they just allow that if you get disrespectful or you torment a sibling or you don't be where you say you're going to be, why can't they just go, oh, he'll outgrow it. He's going to grow up someday. Just let it go. Don't cause any trouble. Well, if they, if they aren't going to discipline me now, there's when I get older, no one's going to discipline me. And I just won't, let's say, get the job, get the raise. So you get disciplined hard by the world. Yep. What's your main way of getting in trouble? Um... Well, sometimes I like to um, keep it going till, see how long I can get it going till I get them to say something. You just push. Yeah. Argue. Nag. Negotiate. Persuade. Um, are you? Are you? Who shuts you down? Mom or dad? Um, my dad. How does he do it? Um, gets that look the tone saying, if you go any farther, you're going to get in trouble. All right. So it is the demeanor. I mean it. It's over, John. He doesn't have to say that, but you, but can, you smell it. You've yeah. lived with him all these years. You know how he does this. Mm -hmm. Which parent is the easiest one for you to get to change his or her mind? Are you going to beat this out one after? They, well, with this, hey, you have my word. <clears throat> this this won't make the air. Okay. Um my mom. Okay. How do you do it? Is she she's the one who'll stand toe to toe and argue longer? Um 
I can persuade her easily, easier. Is that because she's just a more fair-minded person who sees it partly through the eyes of a young 15-year-old man, or, or is it because your dad is just a pillar who won't budge? Um, kind of see, sees it through how I see it. Oh, isn't that sweet? Mm -hmm. Gosh, you must love her more. No. No? But she's nicer. So? <laughs> You're not going to say anything incriminating without your attorney <laughs> here, are you, John? I understand. No, he's on his way. All right. He's, he's, he's going to be here in a mm -hmm. few minutes. Huh? Do you have to do more chores than any kids you know? Um, I would, I don't have to do more than most. I do about average, not, not more than everybody else. Make but. your bed every four days, uh, throw a towel over the towel rack every week and a half, and pick up a shoe before the uh, mold in it sets the fire alarm off, pretty much. Well, sometimes I wait till after, but I try to get well, before. That's very nice of you. Do they know us? Scary, isn't it? You think that children just sort of operate by their seat of their pants, but there's an awful lot more savvy going on here. Now, John was 15, but in our Real Child Psychologist segments, we've had some eight-year-olds who are, they home in on us parents. How do they do this? How do they know us? I always tell my clients, you have to understand, you're the only game in town. That child is pretty much concerned with how he can get what he wishes. I mean, this is fallen human nature. He wants what he wants. It's not an incorrigible kid who's going to, uh, three years from now, be in trouble with the law. This is just a standard kid. So as a result, they only have to focus on us. You've got other children. You've got maybe employment outside the home. You have a family to run. You've got to raise your husband. All right, these are factors here. That's a middle school person. So as a result, they're quite good at sizing this up. Is it, is it because they're treacherous? Is it because this is just a big game? No. You heard between the lines with John, he loved his mom and dad. But he also knew who was more likely to engage him in debate and who wasn't. So, I'm having my children look at all of these and basically see if they can learn something. When we come back, Father Larry Richards with Catechism Wisdom, he's going to talk about the media and in the ways that the media can misguide us. Living Right with Dr. Ray. We'll be back minutes. And the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved and have relationships. And those TV and uh, all the other stuff rob us of our relationships and that connection. Let the siblings work out their own problems. Don't interfere. Don't play referee. This is dumb. has more wisdom about living right. The Catholic Church was founded by Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago. Or modern society with its trendy notions ever shifting on sand, led spearheaded oftentimes by modern psychology. With me here on Catechism Wisdom, as always, Father Larry Richards, pastor of St. Joseph Church, Bread of Life community in Erie, Pennsylvania, and a very well-traveled and well-trod <laughs> speaker? Just like Menorah, I'm everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'd like to quote from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, section 2496. The means of social communication, especially mass media, can give rise to a certain passivity among users making them less than vigilant consumers of what is said or shown. Users should practice moderation and discipline 
in their approach to the mass media. That is especially true of this, right? Right now? Yes. Moderation? Moderation. Moderation. What is wrong? Some people say, I gotta get rid of my TV. Maybe, in some folks, I don't have a computer. Mm -hmm. Is that wrong, Father? Is that stuff bad? It could be. Anything that would be, it alters our reality. Sometimes people just go onto the internet, just sit there and, you know, they get lazy and they spend their whole day just going, going through the TV set, drawing with their mouths, and this is their reality. You've seen me. Yeah, I, I wasn't going to say anything, but that's exactly the point. And God wants us to be engaged with life, engaged with others. And sometimes when we're just on uh, these other media outlets, we just be engaged with a box. We become engaged with a screen instead of engaged with people. Now, you could say, well, there's other people on the other side of that. Sometimes. But they, but, don't, they don't talk to me. Yeah, they're not going to like, <laughs> me. If they do, you have a problem. Well, you know, so, but the reality is that we have to go and say, God's calling us to so much more. And think about how much time is wasted of our lives just watching TV or just going on the internet. And God's created us to make a difference in the world. And so often, too many people are just watching TV. And then sometimes it, they listen to the wrong things. They think that what they're seeing on a TV show or something is reality. And a lot of times it has nothing to do with reality. On Thanksgiving, when the guys get together mm. after we eat, they go watch the football game. Some years ago, I decided I'm going to not do that. I want to sit around the table and talk. Now, the only ones around the table are the women. I was just going to say. <laughs> and, yeah. and after a while, I do get a little tired of talking about mini prints and yeah. bed and breakfasts. And how you need wanna, a point well. Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I want to talk about tire irons and tanks yeah, exactly. and, and battleships. Mm. But I cannot tell you how much better I felt interacting with r real people. The catechism says, don't take this to excess, but I always thought that the best, most talented people in the world are grabbed up to make me watch that. Absolutely, and the deepest need in everyone's heart is to be loved and have relationships. And those TV and uh, all the other stuff rob us of our relationships and that connection. That's why so many people today are so lonely because they don't have real people to interconnect with and they're trying to think, again, it comes to the lie of the box, that if I sit there and watch TV and I see these things or I go on the internet, that I'm gonna connect and it's just uh, so often an artificial connecting this and that's why we're still lonely inside. That God made us need each other on purpose. That he made us need each other, that we come and we get mostly who we are, the best who we are, is when we interact and have relationships with others. I'm going to ask you if you're familiar with this, and I don't know why I'm doing this, because you haven't been familiar with any of these things that I've asked you about. I know. Sorry. They've done studies of people who have watched three or more hours of TV. Their whole view of life is shifted away from the real. No. I know. And, and a lot of times parents will say, well, there's no violence, there's no nasty language, there's no sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yeah, but it shifts the way your kid sees life. He starts to view ideas and notions that are trendy, according to the people who designed the scripts, but in fact are diametrically opposed to God's ideas and sure. ways. I think we have to always encounter what is real, not what people perceive as real. And every time we watch TV, it's a perception of reality that the best thing for all of us is have an encounter with what's real with the people around us. But that also goes to our encounter with God, that God is real and we have to have this encounter with him. We just don't go through the motions. We just don't watch a, a TV show or listen to other people. If that's all we're doing is listening and watching someone else tell us about God, even if it's this program today, it's not enough. God's saying, I want you to interact with me. I want a real relationship. What, what channel is he on? Yeah, it's not on this one. But the reality is, yeah, of course, this is EWTN. God is on this channel. <laughs> yeah, but a, God is taking us much, much farther. deeper. And he wants us to go deeper into our relationship, our relationship and our encounter with him. The culture says, if it's there, it's okay. If it's technologically abounding, take it in. The Catechism says, not only moderation, but really hypervigilance, not just for adults, but with children. Mass media, 
can bring us closer to God. It can be one component. But if we allow it to rule us the way it wants, there's a pretty good chance it'll pull us away from God. For Catechism Wisdom, I'm Dr. Ray. As always, Father Larry Richards. In psychology, we always struggled with what can you study? How do you design a study? I would like to know, just watching this, if you compared the number of hours someone spent in various media outlets and saw what that did to their relationship with God as you could measure it. In psychology, you've got to measure things. So as a result, would they pray less? Would they miss mass? Would they have more lingering ill will toward people? I'd really like to know that. Now, thankfully, I'm far out of school and I don't have to worry about designing that. But maybe somebody out there would like to design it. I've talked enough. I want to hear what you have to say about this segment. What did it spur for you? Anyone? Sir, would you uh, stand up? Your name, sir. Richard. Richard. Richard, I'm standing on a riser and you're taller than me. I... <laughs> You guys get these tall people on purpose. <laughs> yes, uh, Richard. My wife and I uh, deliberately limit some of the electronic media that comes in our house. Um, but what is too much? Is there limiting too much Facebook, uh, cell phones, televisions, things like that? So in other words, what you're saying is you don't want to sh shut it out totally, completely so your kids look at other people around them and say, what's with us? Do we even have electricity around here? <laughs> Couple of rules. One. Don't look at the average amount of time and say, I'm half average. Don't do that. The average amount of time is way too much. You've got to decide what works for your house. Two, don't let people talk you into, you know, Richard, once they're out of your sight, they're going to go hog wild. The kid is going to live on Spacebook or whatever it is. <laughs> exactly. Shows you how up to date I am, huh? <laughs> Three, you're going to get grief from relatives and friends and people around you. This is a real world. You've got to get used to the real world. Isn't there a certain irony in that? They're talking about exposing your kids to more media and then telling you it's the real world. Sometimes I just look and say, I look for the mute button. Yeah. Don't be ashamed of what you're doing. Recognize it's got to be really screened and supervised. Just play reruns of this over and over <laughs> in their bedroom. One more question. Yes, ma'am, would you stand up there? Today? And your name? Sue. Hi, Sue. Okay, you have the media. Yes. Now, you're raising your children and you're protecting them from the inappropriate media. Trying. But then they go out and play with all their friends. And their friends don't shelter them. They let them watch anything and everything. Yes. And sometimes they do inappropriate things or say inappropriate things. Good stuff. One of the most common things that comes to my attention is parents saying to me, I can't believe what they downloaded on the internet over at his friend's house. I can't believe the woman who I see in mass regularly picked out that video for my nine-year-old and her ten-year-old. You can't assume that people are on the same moral page that you are. You just can't. Those days are gone. You have to know exactly what those folks are going to expose their kid and your kid to. I always tell parents, when you think you know someone's tastes in media, think harder. You can't screen it all out, Sue, and there will be times when your kid bumps into it. However, most parents assume that other parents are going to exhibit good judgment regarding this stuff, that's not a good assumption. Okay? Speaking of not a good assumption, there's a lot of advice out there, a lot, telling parents how to be parents. Some of it's pretty good. Some of it's worth ignoring. <laughs> This is one I'm sure those of you who have more than one child have heard. Let the siblings work out their own problems. Don't interfere. Don't play referee. 
This is dumb. I'm a 10-year-old boy. I'm going to look at my 7-year-old sister and say, I'm bigger than you. I'm smarter than you. I'm stronger than you. I want that toy. But hey, let's work this out. <laughs> a win-win scenario, OK? I remember what it was like to be a 7-year-old girl. I really do. And therefore, I think what I'm going to do is let you play with the toy for half an hour. No, no, no. You play with it for 45 minutes, OK? The dominant child is going to win. And the, uh, the dominant child isn't always the older one. Okay? It's like football. The guy that throws the elbow doesn't get caught. The person who then throws the elbow back gets the flag. The dominant child is going to win. This idea that children can solve their own problems, under what rules? I'm partially socialized. I'm partially moralized. I want to do what I want, and I'm, I'm going to work this out? Now, if they do work it out, if you have two children or three children who do something like that, then if you would, please, um, send me a video, and uh, <laughs> we're going to study them, because I, I think they're androids. <laughs> However, for the most part, children working it out, somebody gets hurt. You have to step in as a parent and have rules of how to work it out. This idea that you're an interferer, if you step in and try to stop this, oh, you're only mom. Let the 11-year-old and the 9-year-old figure it out. This is asking for serious trouble. So my advice, ignore that. Don't ignore me. Ignore what I'm telling you to ignore. Am I going too fast for you here? Sister? <laughs> She's sitting there going. What did we learn today on Living Right with Dr. Ray? Well, we found out from Al Cresta that Christ is Lord. Christ is king. And we got to figure out what king means. We don't like king. I like to vote for my rulers. I don't want to be a, a subject. But unless he's king, you really don't have a relationship with him. We found that out. We found out from our real child psychologist, John, that I know you better than you think I do. And I'm very good at this. And you have to accept that as part and parcel of being a mom, and you realize that. And John's point was, you know, my mom's more negotiable than my dad. My dad just kind of stands there and says dad things. Ah, uh, no. Dad, can I? Nah. This is my dad's vocabulary. Dad, can I go? No. <laughs> okay, I didn't think he knew verbs. What else did we find out? Well, we found out the gentlemen, protect your wives. Do not allow that woman to be mistreated by a child. Don't say to yourself, well, she needs to have her own authority. She needs to stand up to that child and show that child who the parent is. Look, that's why we got a team here. I tell my clients, build on each other's strengths. If one of you is a better disciplinarian, well then good. Support the one who's more negotiable, the one who's more permissive, the one who's more lenient. Give him or her some help. And she's looking at me like, I don't need any help. My <laughs> husband's the one who needs help. <laughs> it has been a delight. Thank you so much for joining us on Living Right with Dr. Ray. I'm Dr. Ray Garendi. Until next time, walk with God. And you got kids, hold them tight by the hand. Next time on Living Right with Dr. Ray, who's more verbal, boys or girls, and does it matter? Parent comparing. How do you know you're right and they're all wrong? What is true freedom? Father Larry tells us from the catechism. An adoption. Do you want to do it? Are you nervous? Would you like to? Find out if you're called. Join us next time.